Welcome to Smart Branding, a podcast dedicated to branding, naming, and domain names. I'm Tatiana Bonneau, and with my guests, we try to help you create and grow strong, memorable, and meaningful brands online. I believe time is one of our most precious assets, and so I want to thank you in advance if you decide to spend the next 30 minutes with us. I promise to do my best to make those worth it. Let's go. So my guest today is Rob Gallo. He's an entrepreneur, founder of Pivotal Zen, where he's bringing casino gamification to every aspect of digital marketing. Hi, and thank you for joining us today, Rob. Hi, thank you for having me, Tatiana. I appreciate it. Let's start with some background. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, you have quite a story there. I looked at your LinkedIn profile. So just, yeah, tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today. Sure. So I started in uh, in the casino industry. Um, didn't know the first thing about it, but I was at the right place at the <laughs> right time. And when I say casino, I mean online casino. So I launched an online casino in 1997. Uh, ran the business successfully until 2010, learned about gamification and the importance of it and how people think about it, leveling up and things like that. And this is before Candy Crush was even a thing, obviously. Uh, sold it in 2010, quasi-retired, and I began consulting. And on most of the consulting gigs that I have, I always think about loyalty, the loyalty programs that they have, which is a form of gamification. You know what I mean? The old style Ticket mm. punch cards of, you know, buy nine sub sandwiches and you get the 10th one free. <laughs> so that's where I got to, to where I am today. Mm. And I'm very curious about um, the name of your current company where you do the consulting, because usually people don't associate gaming and especially like gambling casinos with Zen. Like, how did you get to that? That's a great question, Tatiana. So, uh, the long and short of it is the original company, and it's still in action, is called Peak Gaming Group, right? So that's my consultancy, and I still do that for casino companies. But, um, you know, again, not to be an egomaniac, but I felt that some of the things that I learned over the years would translate beyond just gaming. So mm. I made a conscious, pivotal shift to think about other uh, other verticals, right, that could use the ideology of gamifying or, you know, new customer acquisition and uh, retention, loyalty. Uh, and then mm. the Zen part is just keeping a, uh, a solid life work balance in play in everything that you do. You know, back in the day, I did burn the midnight oil till 2 a.m., you know, running programs and things like that. And it's not to say that it's not important, but as you get older, you need to think about your overall life balance, you know, so mm. uh, that's where the name Pivotal Zen comes from. Mm. Great. I do think, uh, yeah, it's probably, well, I, I, I was going to say it's underestimated. It's not. A lot of people have realized and are realizing what you just said, that gaming and that gamification can apply and does apply to pretty much anything in life. It's not even just in business. We do, you know, like learn with playing and then we do progress with playing. So you, and there's so many things that um, apply, like you say, um, across industry. So yeah. tell me a, a bit more about like who and how do you help with Pivotal Zen? So if you look at, let's say a hotel, right? Every hotel that you know of has a, a rewards program, right? Mm. So the more days you stay, the higher uh, retail value that you pay for a room, the more points you get. The airlines have been doing the same thing flawlessly for decades. Um, mm. Obviously, it started in the casino industry at that point where you know you put your credit card in. I mean, your your player's card in, and the more you play, the more points you get, the more free stuff you get. So it's it's like that, but in any industry. So you think about uh, a local grocery store, or Starbucks. Starbucks has a, a, phen mm. a phenomenal loyalty program. So loyalty and gamification go hand in hand, not to the degree that loyalty is generally an emotional state. A company gains your loyalty, generally speaking, by creating an emotional connection. It's not the number of points that you have, but it's what those points represent. Mm. So being a member of, let's say, American Airlines Advantage, which I am, 
and I, I don't anymore, but like when I had the casino, I would travel a, a ton, right? Mm. And when I did, to get an easy upgrade into first class would be nice. Um, and it's appreciation of that and the relationship that I have with American Airlines as a result. American Express is the same thing, right? The rewards mm. program that they have is kind of a, a gauge to say how much uh, I, I work with that company. And, you know, there's also examples, and I've, I've said this on, on my podcast tons of times, that American Express, I'll tell you a story, a quick story. American Express, I've been a card member since 1987. But anyway, we built a house in New York when we first got together, my wife and myself. And uh, we had a swimming pool put in. And the guy that put the pool in said he was going to come back the next season and open the pool up and get it swimmable because we had one of those loop lock covers and it turned green, pea green over the, <laughs> over the wintertime, oh, which yeah. is normal in New York, right? So he comes back and he charges me $1,395. So that's to take the cover off, get the pool swimmable, put this diving board on and, this, and reassemble the slide. So anyway, after about two weeks, he can't get it clear. And I said, and, oh, but he still charged me. And I said, well, I'm not paying you $1,300. I had put it on my American Express. I'm not paying you $1,395. I said, I'm, uh, so I called American Express. I said, I'm willing to pay him $395 because he took the pool cover off, put the pool, you know, the diving board on and the slide. And that was it. But I still mm -hmm. can't swim in it. Right. Yeah. So now I'm a good customer for them. But, but so they, what they covered the balance of the $1,000. Oh. I didn't have to pay it. Oh. And they ended up sending us flowers for having to call American Express in the first place. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, cool. I'm assuming also because he must have been a good merchant with them mm. that they covered it for him. Mm. So that put me on the trail of being an American Express card member for life. Mm. That's, that's a great story. But how do you scale that? Because that... I mean, uh, that's yeah. That's a great question. So it's funny you say that. So the, the way you would scale it is from a back-end perspective, American Express would look at me and see the volume that I transact with them and say, this guy's worth the $1,000 that we're going to spend now because we know the LTV, the lifetime value of this client, if we do this for him, will be astronomical. Mm -hmm. And I, I probably have spent, I'm going to just say, Eight ten million dollars in American Express of my over my last forty years of a, as a cardholder, right? So mm. I don't know what the numbers are on that, but you know it's significant for them. So from from a scale perspective, you know I, I'm assuming when I call, a little light goes off and they know that it's a high end value client, right? So. Mm. I, I get right in front of the queue seemingly because I, I don't have to wait that long. They recognize my phone number. Uh, so it's, it's things like that, that are scalable with the right technology in the back end. So if you're running a big enough business that you have entry level uh, clients that are coming in and you have top tier clients and you can immediately see the difference, you would direct that to someone in your organization who knows how to engage with, a customer of that value. Mm. Where where does branding come into that? Because just as as you were saying, you know, you were saying the story, and I'm thinking, okay, but how do you scale that on so many levels? You know, how do yeah, you just said you just the the system? It's how, it seems um, so easy and so human, and so you know, oh, that person on the phone got the things you know right, and however they handled it in the back end, but. That can that can go horribly wrong if somebody's making the wrong choices uh, on 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 that side. Um, and I was thinking, I think brand and branding does play into that. In that, something I talk to a lot when it comes to the um, brand representation on the that um, strong brand where everything clicks and everything makes sense and it's really together and it goes into the name and domain you know what i deal with but it also goes into the mission and purpose and the team and and so it makes when there's that clean line it makes it so much easier so much easier for people in those situations to make the right choice correct 100 percent. so it's generally speaking it should be a top-down approach meaning Whoever is starting a company, let's just say you're a brand new startup, 
you need to have your vision and mission clearly written that you know what your focus is and anyone else who comes on your team knows what your ethos, the company ethos is, meaning uh, take Apple, for example. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Apple is one of the biggest brands in the world. Now they make it a mission to create great products, cool service, but also very engaging customer interactions. So again, to get a multi-trillion dollar company on the telephone and have them walk you through a problem, even though you might be our warranty, mm. that's going above and beyond. So plenty of other companies that are big brand names, Patagonia, uh, Zappos, all have the company culture that they will help even if it's not necessarily in their best interest to the degree that they're not going to make money financially, but their brand will be talked about and will be positioned as a leader in that space, whatever that space mm. may be. That's mm. what I think about branding. Branding is the company's mission and vision and how it interacts with each individual end user of their product or service. Mm. And you just said like how, how that is going to get talked about. I think because like I do, I mean, in, in the podcast, I talk to different people, but it's, um, I'm going to say something that, that like, it's going to make you sound very old, but you did mention when you started, <laughs> when you started with the casino business uh, and at the time, I think, there's probably a huge advantage in that casinos and gambling and that sort of industry, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm guessing there, but I would imagine even then um, people were talking and referrals were a huge thing even back then, where yes. at the same time it wasn't really for a lot of industries and it is now because social media you know, made everything open, everybody's discussing everything. But you know, 1997, it wasn't the case. Correct. It was just you know starting out. So how has that affected um, how, how we do business? So positioning is everything, right? So positioning is where are you positioned as a brand in the marketplace? So think of Starbucks, think of Dunkin' Donuts, right? They both sell and mm -hmm. serve coffee, but they have both different ideologies about how they do it. Starbucks is high-end. Again, I don't want to say snooty, but it has that... I'm part of this Starbucks culture. I pay $7 for a coffee. I don't drink coffee, so mm. I can say this. Mm -hmm. Dunkin' Donuts seems more fun, energetic. You know, they just did that new Super Bowl campaign with the Don Kings. It was fun. It was, it was, it was engaging, mm. right? So that's, they both sell the same product or service, and they both have their own branding methodology, but it speaks to different people in different ways. So mm. that each one of those things is called positioning. So the positioning is, again, sort of replicating what I said before about your own mission and vision and how you go about doing it, conveying that not only to your uh, team members and employees, but to the general public. So to give you, again, another case in point story. So back in 1997, people were not as comfortable putting their credit card on the internet as they are now. Mm. It, even though the technology is pretty much still the same with the 256-bit encryption, blah, blah, blah. I'm not a tech guy. But the point is, is that we needed to overcome that. So we mm -hmm. asked our existing base of customers who were already playing with us, what was your biggest decision and determining factor in picking an online casino? Not just us, but what, what's the most important thing to you? And mm -hmm. I think it was 82 or 85% of people had said, trust and security. So mm. we took that information and we rebranded. We, we put up a new logo, hired some people to, to help us with the brand. And actually the logo that's still in effect today for Omni Casino looks like a little bank, right? It mm. has a little triangle top. That was what we did. And then we positioned ourselves as the most trusted and secure online casino. And we backed it up mm. with 256-bit RSA technology, blah, 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 blah. And that's how we positioned ourselves. And it's mm. still in existence today. That company is still running. Wow. That's a great moment, actually, for my next question. But Because trust 
is one of the like huge points when when we talk about domain names. Um, you know, the is the domain name matching the company name? What's the extension? Those are things like even at the well, it's not just now, uh, but it's getting more and more to be the case where there are so many companies. Uh, there's a limited pool of good names. And you end up oftentimes even in the same industry with having companies that have the same or similar names and then like the confusion that goes around, you know, and, and so it quickly becomes where the one that actually has the domain name that is perfectly matching the brand name with the com extension is like a status symbol almost like, oh, so they are the thing, you know, yes. I can trust them. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? What's your experience on that? Tips, do's and don'ts? Yes, I, I concur that it does have that cachet that it is a, a .com. It's just like having an old 1-800 number as opposed to mm -hmm. an 888 or an 866 or an 877 or whatever the new ones are now. You know, uh, like in New York City, if you have a 212, they know you've been established for forever. So I, I get that. And that's something you can't necessarily fake. You can't fake longevity. It, it is what mm -hmm. it is. Um, but at the same time, Given today's world, I think from a branding perspective, I, I totally love that idea. You know, everything should be the dot com. But in today's world with the technology the way it is, where most of it is just a click instead of a hand typed URL, it doesn't have the same sort of value that it did for free social, uh, uh, social media campaigns where it's just a click mm. away. You know what I mean? So mm. again, case in point, I love stories. Um, we originally launched uh, a poker room after it was called Caribbean Sun Poker because we were in the Caribbean and it was just nice. So we did an advertising campaign in Buffalo and we, we weren't getting any responses. And we're, obviously we had uh, Caribbean, um, Caribbean, Caribbean Sun Poker dot com, but people couldn't spell Caribbean. So oh. we ended up buying the domain sunpoker.com, rebranded, and that was the rest of history, obviously. We did. Well <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. And I think um, if, if we're going to hang around the topic of what do entrepreneurs get wrong, and you do a lot of consulting, so that's that's my next question. But I think that's definitely falls into that where – um, even experienced entrepreneurs would get an idea, not just about naming, can be anything, and they feel it's a good idea, and and they like really have to hit it with with the reality of how what do users think about it, and it's so simple and simple as a rule, like you like the of course, but it's crazy how how many people don't you know don't get it or forget it even. Yes, uh, again. Uh, going back to a story, I'm not the target market. I don't play casino games, mm -hmm. right? So when I first started in the casino industry, I didn't know the difference between the whole percentage of video poker, blackjack. I said, I'll figure it out. How hard could it be? That said, <laughs> me knowing that I was not the target demographic because I would never play an online casino because I don't play in a land-based casino. I play poker and that's a little different. Um, so the psychology of a gambler, I had to learn. And I mm. engaged with people who knew better than I did. So my advice normally to uh, a startup entrepreneur is surround yourself with people who know more than you. Mm. You know, being the smartest person in the room is not the best thing. You know, if you surround yourself with smarter people, you'll learn from their experiences. And you have to be able to, you have to have your bullshit detector on too. So sometimes mm. people will be able to snow you. I get it. But at the same time, if they can back it up with quantifiable, realistic, uh, you know, uh, case study data, then by all means, I would suggest listening to them. So again, um, you know, as, as it revolves back to branding, I think you're 100% spot on, Tatiana, that a lot of people just make the mistake of thinking, hey, this is a cool name, let's just go with it, as mm. opposed to thinking about it from a logical reason as to why the name exists. So like Zynga Poker, right? Zynga mm. Poker became a huge brand and he just named it after his dog. But he <laughs> used that as part of the branding. In fact, the logo is his little dog. So mm. that makes sense. You know, building a brand around a name, the word Nike or Adidas mm. or, you know, it, it's just a name. 
Um, but it's better than Tom's plumbing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's recognizable and it, it, but it takes a little more effort to get people to recognize that name, but it, it gives you a clean slate to build a brand around it and, and position the brand exactly the way you want it. And I give this bit of advice. If you don't position yourself in the marketplace, your, your competitors will do it for you and you won't like what mm. they put you. <laughs> that's a, that's a good one absolutely do does what you do now with with pivotals and does it apply to anyone any industry like who can reach out to you for help yeah anyone i mean uh, industry agnostic business is business i mean it's uh you know creating Uh, the brand is the first pillar. The second brand is attracting new customers. So that's user acquisition. And you do that through a multiple uh, of methods, one of which is a referral program or an influencer program. And then the final one is the third of the pillars is um, uh, customer retention. And that's done with loyalty and not necessarily just points, but gamification of the consumer's interaction with your brand. So regardless mm. if it's a casino or not, um, it works in every industry because it, it's currently in place in every industry. Mm. What about artificial intelligence? I can't get like not to mention that. And especially like if we're talking about um, a lot of, I, I don't know how it is now. I did have some, uh, I don't know, 10 -ish years ago, some experience uh, working with, Mm, content creation agency they were creating content for gambling brands and mm -hmm. there was like a that a huge network of of blogs pbns all that uh, and i was just recently i don't know how it popped up was thinking about because like there were people writing all that and i'm thinking that must be now replaced probably with artificial mm -hmm. intelligence at least like to a huge you know some like pretty decent percentage so How how do you feel it has been and will affect, um, well, your line of business? Yeah. All right. Well, so I I look at artificial intelligence similarly to the uh, adoption of the internet. You know, people back in mm. the early '90s and mid '90s, late '90s, were saying that it was going to be uh, you know a monumental change and it was going to drive people out of work. It doesn't do that. Um, it's the same mistake that people make thinking that online casinos are going to cannibalize land-based casinos and it's the exact opposite more people play online uh, land-based casinos after playing online than they than otherwise mm. uh, so the the advent of artificial intelligence is not going to it'll eliminate some jobs just like the internet did just like you know things like that but it's not going to be the end of the world at mm. least at le uh, from from a practicality perspective where The danger is, is in the deep fakes. That's mm. going to be a whole other issue. And I don't want to get into the nitty gritty on this particular podcast, but yeah, that's a whole nother issue. But again, from a practicality standpoint and for the good side of AI, I think it has tremendous amount of value in helping people produce better content faster. That said, mm. I think people that are producing content and publishing it without really reviewing it and humanizing it is a mistake because mm. I've been using ChatGPT for months and you can definitely tell when something is written by ChatGPT. Mm. It has its own blueprint or a thumbprint, so to say. Mm. Uh, but again, from an infrastructure standpoint, and when I say infrastructure, I mean building the templates that you would then use and have human interaction for the creativity Um, you know, prompt engineering became a thing now. I don't, I'm sure you know mm. what that is. You know, the ability to ask the computer the right questions to get the response that is going to best fit your needs is its own industry. And it's going to mm. continue that way. So, mm, Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. I do think it's a, it's a great tool. And yeah, and, and it's, it's, it is already, it's going like very quickly. It's already becoming, um, I don't know, I feel like it, it was, Um, there, you know, with the internet, there was like everything. We are a net company, we're a cloud company, we're an AI company, we are whatever company. And then it becomes so um, spread onto everything you're doing that it, you don't even talk about it anymore. It's just how things are. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, it's not new. People think it's new. I mean, it only seemed oh, yeah. new because, uh, you know, open AI grew as quickly as it did and it became as big as it was or is mm. now, you know. Uh, but I think the offshoots from it are really interesting. You know, so what they're doing is text to graphics, right? Text to image is mm. really cool stuff. Um, Very cool, there, yeah. There's another one called perplexity.ai and they mm. actually create a podcast. A AI creates a podcast and delivers it every day for the three top oh. subjects. And it's about a five minute podcast and it's read by a guy that sounds real, but it's total AI. It's amazing. Oh, cool. I haven't seen that. I'm going to check that out. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> Very cool. Oh, well, goodbye to my podcast then. <laughs> cool. So last question, what's next? What are you looking forward to this year professionally, like with both of your brands? Great question. So uh, I just started an engagement with a very uh, dynamic and exciting gaming company. And when I say gaming, you know, iGaming. And uh, I am very, very keen to help this company become a unicorn in the space. I've got, uh, I'm working together closely with the CEO and the president of the company uh, to create the strategic and tactical plan. They're on their way already. Um, they've done a tremendous amount of growth in the last eight months since they've uh, established more than I've ever seen in my, in my career. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about that. But, uh, you know, on a, on a personal level, I became a grandfather for the second time uh, on Super oh, wow. Bowl Sunday. So I'm excited about oh, that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Very Thank cool. you. Yeah. Very cool. Well, that's it. Life Wonderful. is Wonderful. That's good. That's great to hear. Well, that's been an absolute pleasure, Rob. We, we're going to include how people can reach you in the write-up for the podcast. Thank you so much. It's been, it's been great. Yeah, fantastic, Tatiana. Any, anything I could do in the future, just let me know. You hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm there pretty much once a day at least. Sure. Thank you. All right. Welcome to Smart Branding, a podcast dedicated to branding, naming, and domain names. I'm Tatiana Bonneau, and with my guests, we try to help you create and grow strong, memorable, and meaningful brands online. I believe time is one of our most precious assets, and so I want to thank you in advance if you decide to spend the next 30 minutes with us. I promise to do my best to make those worth it. Let's go!